Hi everybody and thanks for tuning in and welcome to episode 97 of the Road to the Hills podcast sponsored by Chia Charge. Chia Charge has been fueling adventures with real food made with real ingredients since 2012. Go and check them out at www.chiacharge.co.uk. Change of scenery for you this uh, week, Eddie? Well, change of scenery, you may be able to hear the... Can you hear them? The crickets? Can you hear the, sort of, the crickets in the background? Let's just say we're not in Crete, Gary. We are not in Crete. Mm. Our purses are a little lighter. Oh we go looking for ice cream money and there's some of us left. Anyway, we have come away on holiday. We're all together, as my husband has said, kept saying. Yeah. At least we're all together. And I go, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> That's a great one. No, I'm joking. Uh, yeah, we did a last minute, last minute, last minute. We held out for that passport which never arrived um and we have actually just been on the phone to the british consulate that we had to do like a zoom meeting with the british consulate guy to oh. get um to get another temporary passport for which was for the trip that we didn't uh, we had to cancel but we are going back to england in a few weeks time so we said let's just keep the appointment yeah and yeah. then we just got this passport so we don't have the drama so we didn't tell him and then once we were on it he obviously couldn't and rory was sitting there waiting <laughs> to do to answer all the questions and he couldn't then go well i can't give you one for this trip so he was he was really yeah. nice anyway awesome uh, so we'd still got away it's the yeah. it is baking i mean i <laughs> That's what we're talking about. We like a bit cloudy and drizzly, but not cold in the UK. Well, yesterday, um, it was about for my morning run. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about holiday running and people, how people do their holiday running. Hopefully lots of people will be going on lovely holidays this summer. I don't know how, when you last went on a family holiday, Gary, but I love a bit of holiday running, but I was, I treat it a little bit differently, almost like a little bit of a holiday from, from the old training plan anyway yeah um so i but it is freakishly hot as well so yesterday when i went out for my morning run and i was wait lying in bed uh, they the only air conditioning we've got is in Bryn and i's bedroom so i'm just going to lie in there <laughs> <laughs> and i thought i thought oh Bryn, still why is Bryn not going for his run come on it's getting late well, late later it's like 20 past seven i was like why is he not gone so i was sort of pottering around and i came out and i was having a cup of tea and i was like are you gonna go for your run because you were gonna go first and i was gonna go second and he's like i've been i've gone i've dried off <laughs> <laughs> the temperatures fell and we needed up. So yesterday morning I went out and um, it was it was a cruisy about 26, 27 degrees. Um and so it's literally like short top and we've got to climb straight up out of where we're staying. Oh, it's, oh, it's really dry, the air is so dry, but it's amazing. All these olive groves, it's lovely. Just gotta take your time. Oh, Every time, magic. Every time I try and run a little bit faster, I'm like <gasps> <laughs> nope, again. Uh, I also always really notice when I come down from altitude that the first couple of days I really struggle with the breathing. That's interesting. Um, yeah, you'd think you'd come down and be like, oh, superhuman. Oh, superhuman. I've never really noticed any. My Bryn really noticed real, he feels really strong when he comes down from altitude. I don't feel any different, really. Mm. Um, but it takes me a couple of days to get used to all the air. I don't, it's like I don't know what to do with it it's nothing to do with fitness levels <laughs> sorry. anyway then i uh, so i did a little little run in the morning and then we went to the beach for the day and we had to leave the beach because it was lit we were literally boiling alive even oh, though we like right in the sea it was really windy it was lovely you know when you just know i was looking at the kids going this is you this is too much we came home 41 degrees gary 41 degrees yeah, as a parent, and you need I, to know to, when to pull the plug on those days. We had to, we even were like, put the television on, come inside. They were like, can we just go in the pool? Can we just go in the pool? No, put the television on, come inside, yeah. sit down, breathe more something. <laughs> and I went out for my evening jog and yeah, 41 degrees. It was pretty, um, it was pretty much, I actually really love running in the heat. As long as I don't have to run at any pace, yeah. I love yeah. like how warm you know how like it just feels everything feels like the muscles just you just go straight out and 
But then afterwards you spend, I literally spent three hours wiping the sweat. Still I'm doing it now from this morning. I'll put up a lip. What is it um, when you start running, you just, everything oh just comes God, out? And then I made a mistake because then I had a shower and I put a load of after sun on and then I just sweated that all out for like <laughs> three hours. I was trying to eat my barbecue. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah. It's hot. So I thought I'd just talk a little bit about hol like holiday training and how, how we manage. And we've obviously done a lot of holidays with kids now because our kids are getting older. And it, the biggest thing is that you can't both go running at the same time because the kids aren't old enough to be left. Yeah. On their own, especially when there's a swimming pool. Um, and so it takes up quite a lot of time if you both want to go running. So I found that on holidays, it's better to go shorter runs. You can do a couple of, <laughs> I find it's better to do like a short, a longer sort of 45 minute to an hour in the morning. I can sort of get yeah. away with that. And then if I want to top it up, it's easy to get out for like half an hour in the evening when everybody's tired or having a pre-dinner swim or whatever. And yeah. then I just change the sessions. And I've got all these like little holiday sessions I do they're super easy so if you don't know what you're doing and what I always do is I when I get to a new place I love a map quick look on a map and I make a 5k try and make a 5k loop so I know where I'm at no, yeah. never too far from home okay are you try and make it try and make it a circle and then from there I then add on bits like every run so you slowly get to know the area but you never go yeah. No, you never want to be too far away and you can just add on bits and change it and I love exploring as love a bit of an explore but also I'm always aware that my exploring then could potentially become three hours heavily dehydrated but sometimes with a map, at home where... I, I remember once it was uh i was at disney in paris and um i mapped out a few runs and there wasn't paths in some of the places that i yeah. thought there would be so yeah. there's always a bit of a, a bit of a uh, risk i looked at strava like and you know you can plan your route if you're a strava premium you can go give me a five mile route okay but then i looked at it and i was like i don't really want to cross the the big road <laughs> that's 2k down the hill thanks i'm going to stay up in the hill so i've just been doing my so i always do that i always map out a little 5k route and then you're safe and then you can add on a little bit especially obviously it's a bit different when you're a woman as well yeah. you're running it's really really quiet here and there's only like olive grove farmers that keep looking yeah. out their trucks at me um so just so that you're safe and then um you sort of know where you are and so i added on i thought god i didn't have my watch on this morning i thought i'm gonna add on an extra loop this morning this is gonna be a mega run <laughs> so i set off i didn't uh, i didn't have time or anything I went off got back home i was like absolutely dripping Ooh, how far was that that must have been six or seven miles four miles four oh miles. my god <laughs> oh my <laughs> okay well, that's why know, i always have my watch on <laughs> no nasty surprises I, I honestly thought that must be about 10k i've been out it felt like i've been out for about like 45 minutes there is a lot there was about 600 feet of climbing but i was like oh god's sake <laughs> so yeah lovely lovely to be on holiday i'm just going to be running around the, the olive grows looking yeah. for that elusive fitness <clears throat> which has failed me again so last week we talked about i wasn't very well um, and I got very ill, Gary. I was so ill, I had to go to the doctors. It was uh, what I thought was a saddle sore became horrible infection. Oh, we don't need horror. anybody to tell that. <laughs> I was expecting that. <laughs> I'm sorry, but all sorts of infections. And uh, I ended up, yeah, Bryn was like, oh, please, I'm just going to take you to the doctor. Um, and so some, and some pretty strong antibiotics, but it meant that we were then trying to sort this holiday. Oh, it's so horrendous, Gary. Trying to sort, cancel the holiday, sort the new holiday, pack all the time oh, wow. feeling like my innards were going to fall out any female will get this and i just so i packed the most i just went today to go well what should i wear today i'm like i didn't actually really pack any clothes for myself i've got like a pair of running i obviously was like i don't care i can't see myself i forget investigators <laughs> i wear the same um, clothes all week anyway on holiday yeah it's fine With isn't it proper dirt bag um uh proper dirt bag. <laughs> got washing machine so i had a bit of a miserable end of last week but um that's life in it that's life anyway we're down here we've got a lovely holiday planned relax lots of lovely olive grove jogging lots of tanning i never get it when people go oh i couldn't go on like a beach holiday uh uh like a 
Whoa. And I, when you've got kids, I mean, it's the best. My kids. They love it. And you get to like sit and read and have cups of tea. And I don't have any problem. I enjoy both types of holidays. I like a bit of action, going exploring and stuff like that. I don't mind a theme park holiday. I love a beach holiday too. When you put your foot <laughs> in that warm sea, especially like my sea is the North Sea. <laughs> that is and like there's coal and stuff floating around <laughs> drones old drones yeah a few drones <laughs> too, with that warm mediterranean sea it's like oh, and the wow. air i mean it's it's amazing and france is so lucky we were talking about this as we drove down in between my like when i was actually awake as we were driving down <laughs> um that france people that live in france are so lucky because they literally have like the whole world in one country so you yeah, can yeah. be like we live <clears> in the mountains skiing it's really seasonal and you get really cold weather you can be in big cities and then five yeah. hours you can drive down and literally be hotter than the side of hell and by the sea which is the same got. isn't it yeah do you yeah. need like say france or america like you say you actually don't really need to travel overseas you've got it all there yeah. i'm not sure if that's a good thing though knowing quite a lot of um, french people as well maybe they do need to do a little bit more <laughs> oh yeah it's always good to reach out uh, anyway how you was up not so much upper lip sweating as me this morning. No, no. <laughs> Bit of a mixed bag, actually. Generally feel good. I am not pooly, which is good. Um, <laughs> I really, on, on Tuesday, my, my run on Tuesday was supposed to be a 15 minutes threshold, which I thought at the beginning of it, that's quite easy, a 15 minutes in threshold pace, but I just couldn't. I don't know what it was. I felt the fueled and everything, but I just couldn't get going. So I was a really came away from that thing and... Yeah, I'm not too. I was, I was really kind of despondent after that run. But then on Thursday, I'd saved my 25 minute threshold run for the for the for the Thursday Thursday group. Um, and there must have been, oh, it could have been six of us out there. And uh, that went really well, really really good run there. And um, the only thing that wasn't good is when you're trying to chase down a 23 year old and a 28 year old. That 20, you know, I still feel quite fit and able, but 20 odd years, uh, and especially when these guys are quite fit anyway, they're not just coming from a sedate background, they're quite fit. I just, uh, Neil and I we were going up one of the, we, we call it um, Craggy Bank, and we were both blowing out of our backsides. But what we thought we're running, and up ahead, we could see uh, Gary Reese and Chris walking, but we still couldn't catch them. <laughs> <laughs> were they chatting at the same time and oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Gary yeah just chats away I got the, the different another Gary um just chatting away and I'm thinking don't talk to me because I literally can't so, so, <laughs> that's when you, I've got a friend like that and she can chat of any incline of yeah. any hill and me and my other friends joke because we go we just always ask a leading question so we yeah. go Tell me a bit about your current training plan. Yeah. <laughs> she starts talking, yeah. and then you literally just let the blood throw through your ears. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm quite a heavy breather yeah. anyway. Are you, Gary? Once you get yeah. into yeah. your... Yeah. When I was that, like a good... nearly the, the 160 beats a minute, why I'm um, breathing oh, pretty No, hard. it's just me, the breathing. <laughs> Sometimes I'll ham the breathing up. If it's a race, I'll ham it up to make me sound Sometimes like I'm... Sometimes I quite like the comfort of it. Like, when you're at this <laughs> tempo, you just sort of get in a... Uh, uh, it's one it gets more guttural but you know oh no it's going up to 168 it's going to the dark place <laughs> but yeah if you ever any doubt the power of the group the two sessions the the session i was quite intimidated by 25 minutes was so much better than this 15 minutes run on my own and then sunday we went over to the lake district and we ran from braithwaite to wasdale it's just outside of wasdale actually where the checkpoint is on the 100 and then back again, we stopped for a coffee in the middle. That section, it's quite easy navigation-wise. I didn't really, uh, because I'm not, the last time I went on a lot of this course was 2017, actually, when I did the race. So I'm quite like, oh, I've been so obsessed with the Bob Graham round. I've neglected Lake yeah, 100. Yeah. But NAB on that section was fine. And coming in the bottom here, it's, you won't see it on the race. But well, I'm not too sure if anybody will. I think it will be dark for everybody. So you won't appreciate what a beautiful little spot that is but yeah. um a little bit more technical than i remember so a wet day might be a bit <laughs> a bit interesting it doesn't, rain. it doesn't rain in the lake district you'll be fine oh yeah we had everything actually on sunday it went the whole old shebang with wind rain then it was roasting hot um but yeah i really enjoyed that and what was really good we there's a pass in between kirkfell and pillar 
and every time I've been there recently, it's I've just been going up to in this we call it the Red Gully um, on the Bob Graham round when you go to the Pop Curve Bell, and it was like, oh great, I don't have to go up there today. <laughs> <laughs> but we could see people up there, and I'm always like, oh, would you go up there just yeah. for fun, or would it be? Are you always on a bob pretty much when you go up there? Should have up open tracking and see who was oh. doing a Bob Graham round. Sarah Perry did the Bob Graham round this weekend, and it was a successful one, 22 hours. And I think she hoped for uh, a lot better weather being a summer round. And I think the temperatures were definitely improved, but I'm pretty sure she got wet and windy up on the higher fells there. But yeah, well done, Sarah. Um, and that was uh, that was that was really good. And last, <laughs> it's funny. I remember one time when I was up on that red gully. There was Neil, myself, and a guy called Mark, and we were so dehydrated and out of water we were licking the stones because it's like a little trickle of a stream and it's it's red the water's red but we were pretty <laughs> we were pretty cool true. we were trying to we were trying to get our bottles we were like wet hands i was licking my hands I, oh yeah it was pretty it was pretty full on look I, i'm alive to tell the tale <laughs> I I remember once doing a training camp in back in Ironman days and doing a four hour bike and having to do a 10 mile run off it I dropped my bottle without realizing and got out for the five mile was so dehydrated in meal probably it must have been about the same temperature here that I was I licked licking my arm for the salt and for the sweat all the way back <laughs> again live to tell the tale yeah yeah the king <laughs> So I just hear this trickle of water. I'm just thinking, I need something. Oh, I need, my I God, need water. don't. I know, I know. It just took a lot longer than what we thought. But what was awesome, actually, on Sunday, we bumped into a listener, uh, a guy called Shane Nesbitt, and he's actually doing the Lake Mahuga too, so we'll see him again on the trails. Oh, and um, How did he look? Did he look in shape? Did you take him down? Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't, you know, um, when you meet people sometimes before a race, and they're like, oh, yeah, training's been this and that, and he was pretty much... He's doing about 15,000 a week elevation, which is pretty solid. My goodness me. And um, his quads didn't kind of tell a lie. I'm pretty sure he has been doing about 15,000 feet because he's, I had to do a double check when, double take when I saw his quads. <laughs> so. Did you did have quad envy? He was tensing because he was talking to you and he wanted you to admire them. <laughs> <laughs> but it is always awesome. I love it. You know, if we <clears throat> kind of meet someone who listens to the show and actually enjoy the show, that's quite good. So, um, <laughs> to listen. give me some critic, give some critique. But uh, yeah, great to see you, Shane. And yeah, all the best on your training coming up. Well, pretty much tapering now, you know, one maybe this week. Oh, wait, six, three weeks to go. It's three and a bit weeks. Yeah. So, I suppose for me, one last one, big run. I'd like to get over the lakes after this, but maybe just more kind of recceing as opposed to going off and doing anything <clears throat> too arduous. But what I am doing, I've done that classic, you know, kind of, is it comparison is the thief of joy? Normally when you kind of compare yourself to other people, but I've been comparing myself to 2017, Gary. Oh, that's <laughs> It's basically, so I'm a lot older. You're looking at my garment stats from 2017. I'm five years old, obviously. I'm not as fast. It's similar as that. But I'm not as fast, and um, <clears throat> I, re- I I do talk about weight quite a lot because I, you know, on this podcast. But I'm heavier too. So there's three things that I'm like. The three anti-running variables you've stacked <laughs> up against you. Hey, but you know what you've got, Gary? Old man strength. You got me in your corner. Hey, that's, that's all I need. That's all you need. And you've got the 8,000 other people, the list of podcasts, yeah. all supporting you. Oh, get the positives. Get the positives. I'm Don't super. Worry about any of that. Like, you've I'm... done a book round and you're stronger. You might be faster over the front end of that race, but I reckon you're going to be strong in that second half. Well, well this is the my whole dilemma with this Lake 100 because I've seen my heart rate chart when, when i did it and it was just like a wedge of the effort reducing over, over all the miles so i really want to even that out but that is going to take some discipline over that first say marathon and i did it a few times on sunday i tested out say running a few miles and not getting my heart above 130 beats a minute um you know we'd been out in in all i think it was about eight hours so it wasn't just like i was straight out of the car and then running at say 130 beats a minute um so it's kind of a good test but we'll do that again obviously this weekend um a proper test this weekend but yeah i'm really it's funny because i'm not sandbagging I, I, this is not sandbagging i'm going to go out 
I, I'm very kind of mindful about being older and slower. Um, but yes, also, I'd like you say, I've done probably two or three years of Bob Graham round fit on, on the fells. But I have to go out with this 130, <clears throat> maybe going 135 beats a minute. This It's just below, it's the very high end of my easy pace which I think based on the other races I've done where I've kind of gone to this 140 beats a minute, I just think that's too high for me. That's entering this aerobic zone. And you know probably a lot more than me as a coach. I don't think I can be aerobic for 100 miles, basically. I don't know if that's, if that's a sensible even place to start. So I want to be this just... Low-end aerobic, yeah. Low-end aerobic, you want to be... You can yeah, be. so that, 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 that for me, that my aerobic, if I've got my heart rate stats correct, is 130 beats a minute yeah. so that's that's what i'm aiming at that could end up being at 29 hours or it could end up being 21 i haven't got a clue to be honest so i, I want to come up i think that if you can if you can run that first half better you can even if you end up being slower you'll have a better race as such the drop off and that's the sort of thing that you yeah. should focus on if you're not in i think you're in better shape than you think you are too well, um, I think the thing that caught up with me last time, obviously fatigue, but my quads, I after Mardale Hill, I really struggled to move at all. The uphills were obviously quite slow, and then the downhills were really painful, and I couldn't kind of open up my legs to run. So, and after the Bob Graham rounds, um, I did I didn't have any quad issues on that, and we've been out on the fells for for twenty two hours. So I'm thinking, part of me's thinking, yeah, my quads are gonna they're gonna they're going to be all right in the day. Quads like Shane. Oh, right. oh my goodness, I wish, I wish. <laughs> but what, what has happened, a friend of uh, mine has loaned me some poles. So I've been out running with poles. Today actually was the very first day with poles. And what I did immediately felt this propulsion that if you, I'm not even sure if I'm using them properly, but I would kind of put them down, uh, but then like push myself forward. And I was like, wow, yeah, you really um, do feel this. And my guns and my shoulders, they're like, you know, rock solid. So I'm not going to have any issues with, <laughs> with that. But what? Like his bicep, does he say that? <laughs> I'm rock what... solid. I'm tough, guys. Don't worry about me and the balls. <laughs> but what is going to be an issue? So I had them in my backpack. I, cl- I took them out. I ran with them for a bit. I collapsed them, put them, put them back in. All that was fine. But when I tried to eat with the poles, I couldn't do that. So I need to do a lot more running with and trying to eat on one hand. What are you trying to do? Well, these had like a a cord that I had to kind of grip to keep the poles together. They weren't like locked together. I think, yeah. So as soon as I released, unless I'm just doing it wrong, I might really need to do it, watch a YouTube video. Um, But um, Mountain King. Mm. They are, I've heard of these brands. They're not like. As soon as you let the pole go, it collapses. It's got like a a bungee cord that you pull up through the middle. Then that kind of pulls everything tight. And then it has like a little little bit that you pinch the cord in. in them in one hand. I could, yeah. But that's just, I I don't want to even have to have pressure on this cord to keep them all together. No, you can't do that. You'll end up like with... Massive oh, crap. crap. <laughs> yeah. So me, I'll have to do a YouTube video. You someone with. from Lecky to come on the show and tell us a little bit well, more yeah. about the poles. <laughs> well, what is good, actually, separate to the Lecky thing, I am meeting up with the Lecky guy, and we're doing a, I'm going to do a YouTube video uh, for the Trail Outlaws people about poles. So I'm super lucky I'm going to get a crash course from somebody um, from Lecky. I look forward to you telling him don't worry i'm stacked up top i've got no problem with <laughs> i want to tell us i'd like you to open. that's how you should open the uh, episode <laughs> i just go in with the guns just go in when you get like a vest top on or maybe just topless <laughs> no. <laughs> what if I'm, uh, really, I'm going to be really cheeky and see if I can um, loan some poles for Lake 100. Um, don't loan them ask for them they're really expensive my lucky poles were Ooh, well, I have 18 pairs of lucky poles for every sport that I do. <laughs> but my running ones are really expensive. They are really, really good. And they're super light, which I love. So I can. And these are really light. Them. And I was immediately so impressed with just that little bit of propulsion. The thing forward. is, now I'm so used to using them going uphill that I'm pretty rubbish without them going uphill now. Because <laughs> I'm so used to taking it all. Yeah. Uh, on the body when I don't have them, I'm like, oh. Do you find, although you are a 
maybe quicker and more efficient do you feel your heart rate's higher because it's a more of an all body a whole body workout or not um mm, no i'm pretty f- efficient with them i reckon now that i've sort of got used to using them and because i use them all through the winter as well i reckon i've got i don't find that i go um i think i probably did at the start but i reckon now yeah. i'm so used to them they're just kind of like an extra limb basically yeah um if anything, I probably find that I push harder without them because I'm pushing down on my legs, okay. on my quads, yeah. maintain the same pace. Um, I'm not so good at I don't use them really on the downhill. I prefer to have my hands out in case I fall, basically. Yeah. Unless it's a really long race, and then I'll keep them out on the downhill because you're not you're just not running at speed. I, I thought about maybe putting my poles in the drop bag at uh, Dale Main, but then I think the damage kind of already happened. So yeah. start, start with them. But- yeah depends if you use them if you use them like like poles i say to people well if you don't carry them if you've got them use them use them there's no point carrying them to delmain <laughs> so these are super light just the fact they kind of fell apart was a bit frustrating and i don't want anything don't anybody out there you'll know whether it's raining or anything you don't want to get cold you don't want anything that's going to stop you eating and that's <clears throat> Ooh, super ever important. in life no. not <laughs> just outside <laughs> Right, we've got to get on because I've got kids waiting to go to Aqualand and I can hear the volume rising outside <laughs> as we've gone. You can't go in the pool, you've got to wait now. Go and play outside. Uh, what's what's going on? What's going on? What results you got for me this week? Yeah, well, I saw my timeline. I had quite a few friends down at Enduro 24 and there was loads of different races. Um, I think like individuals and there was teams, there was large teams, there was pairs, there was small teams. Lots of different races going on, but a listener of the show, Robert Atkinson, and his friend Michael Ward, the dynamic duo Doncaster, took the win Ooh, for the like male it. team. Yeah, awesome. And it's it's like a trail 24-hour yeah. event, and I suppose you just yeah. do as much as you can in 24 hours. I should have checked, actually, uh, Robert, uh, what your accumulated distance was for your team. But, yeah, well done, everybody, and well done, Robert. We had the big UTS races over, the only UTMB um, sponsored, I guess it is, races um, in the UK. The, yeah. And so there's all sorts of drama, high drama. Uh, but the UT, so there are three races, UTS 165K, which was cancelled um, about, the leaders were between about, well, the runners were between about um, 40 to 70K, probably that spread out over the course. Due okay. to really high weather and storms on the top of the course, the runners were put into the various checkpoints that they got to and told they had to wait. And then they cancelled the race. I cannot imagine how that felt if you've been training for oh. that race and you were out on the course. You were starting to get into the depths of it. Um, and so it was cancelled. This is in, this was about uh, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, and then they weren't really sure what was going to happen. And then they were told that then they could, they were bused back to their accommodation. Presumably some of them didn't have accommodation for yeah. that night because they were meant to I think, don't know what happened. Well, I haven't um, booked accommodation for St. Cuthbert's Way because I'm running through the night. <laughs> so. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> And then, um, and then they were given the option to run the either 100k or the 50k the next day, um, or not nothing at all. Um, we don't know what the then standing is. Is they still get their running stones or anything? I guess you probably sign something when you you tick the waiver <coughs> when you uh, sign up for these races. But that is really bad luck. Um, but the weather was obviously really bad. We were talking about it before we started recording, and I had. Um, uh, Amy, who listens to the show, who worked so hard to recce this route, literally spent six months of her life oh, training for this race. Wow. Uh, she was going so well. She was nice and controlled in second place, and it was then cancelled. But she then stood up, and stood up and we decided she was going to do the 50K. I was like, oh. I think you should still do, you should still do something the next day. I was just thinking you won't get I wouldn't head. do it. <laughs> but yeah, it's Night, good there, yeah. yeah, but I guess she had, a, like, she had the whole weekend away. Yeah. Uh, it was all... She, her mum and dad had come to watch her. I guess it was like, I was like, finish it on a like, just go out and have a lovely time and have do the race and treat it as a lovely long run and enjoy the checkpoints and take pictures and completely yeah. different to how you were going to do it the next day. So I think quite a lot of people did that. Um, uh, so we send our love to those that were really disappointed, but we're glad everybody's safe and nobody, you know, I think a lot of the runners were like, we could have carried on, we could have carried on, but it's not just them. It's the safety teams oh, and well, it's the volunteers as well. Yeah. 
it's very different when you're in it as well when you're out in it and you're racing you can often go through some really terrible conditions <laughs> but it's the other people that are stepped you know what i mean like you can be just like, still for hours aren't they really Panic still, yeah. Uh, 100k, the winners were Josh Wade in 13 hours 16 and Rebecca De Lucio in 18 hours 58. They both win a place for CCC at the UTMB. And, um, but I think Josh is actually going on, he's training for UTMB this year. Um, and in the 50k, winners were Jack Scott, or maybe it's Jack was training for UTMB. Okay, I'll need to I'll contact them all, find all the deeds. Five hours 35 and Kirsten Welsh in six hours 23. Well done to everybody who raced, who did those, who did those races. Look forward to hearing more about them um, and seeing how that sort of develops over the next few years. I wonder how, you know, maybe for future years, I don't really know the area, so it's not fair for me to probably comment, but if it's feasible to have a, a bad weather route um, for, for, for maybe going forward, it's, yeah, I, I guess I don't really know the area, so it just might be impossible. This week we chat with Sam Amend. Sam is a mum, GB athlete, 50k, 100k, 24 hours and a British record, 100 miler, 14 hours, 10 minutes and 41 seconds. We catch up with her a week after a record breaking overall win at the Grand Union Canal Race, 145 run from Birmingham to London. I, uh, I just so love to do this race, Eddie. Hey. Oh, it's got to be it. It. Oh my let's God. see it. Let's see what let's Sam has to say. Yeah, let's see if Sam puts you on. We're super lucky to be joined by Sam Amen today, fresh from the Grand Union. Oh, fresh. I wouldn't have even had a shower. She's already done body pump. <laughs> well, uh, if our listeners are familiar with the name, all the way back in 2020, episode five, there's a bit of confusion with our shows, how we've numbered them in the past, but you came on a show about the Thames Path 100. So yeah, if listeners want to go back and catch up with that, that'd be awesome. But we ask every guest these questions. Um... Well, hi, Sam. Where are you? What is the view from your window? Well, you're not near a window. And have you been for a run today? So I'm actually at home and taking a break from work. And I'm sitting out in my garden, which is in South Oxfordshire. So I'm um, near, in, near Wallingford. And have I been for a run? No, I haven't. This is the <laughs> first time in many, many years because I've done so much. And I'm sure you'll get onto this um, in the later conversation. I've done a lot of racing over the last couple of weeks, so I figured with my run that I did at the weekend, because it was so long, I would give myself a few days off. So I agreed with my coach, no running until Wednesday. So no, I haven't, but I have been to the gym. <laughs> well, I think Eddie and I were both pretty surprised when you said you had, uh, was it body body combat or battle combat? Yes, combat? Body, body combat and spin yesterday. But um, it's a little bit like, you know, when you go to the gym and you haven't done anything for a very long time and everything aches the next day, it's yeah. kind of, if you get back <clears> into it and ease yourself gently, I found I went from Saturday where I was shuffling, and I mean proper shuffling, feeling loads of pain, to Sunday starting to walk better and taking my dogs out for the walks, to then feeling kind of really amazing on Monday, thinking, actually, I don't even feel like I've run a marathon. Oh, <laughs> so my I've, goodness. I, yeah, no, I, walk, I did two walks with the dogs. I didn't run. I've stuck to my guns. And then I went to the gym and did some cross training just to get the body back flowing as well because I don't want to stiffen up. I had a massage, which was incredibly painful. And then I went and did spin in the evening. And here I am this morning having done cross training for 30 minutes and yeah. uh, body combat. Yeah. Is the body combat, is it, because, I, yeah, I get the spin, I could probably get my head around doing that, but is, is there a bit of um, impact with the body combat? It's martial arts, so it's obviously almost like shadow boxing, so you do it in front of a mirror, you have an instructor, it's a Les Mills, I love Les Mills um, classes, and I didn't do body pump because it's lifting weights, my body is obviously still fatigued, yeah. um, but it's boxing, uppercuts. Um, twisting so it's all a full workout and any of the really hard intense leg workout depending on how my legs feel although I can yeah. still bounce I just take the impact down oh, awesome. I love it how are your feet holding up um, my feet were quite sore yesterday, but um, because I, I say I like brutal pain, I actually don't. I mean, any runner that's puts themselves through the things that we do, you have to uh, almost accept pain. Um, 
I they were sore, so I had someone use their thumb, this massage therapist, they go on the plantar, which is incredibly painful all around the ankle, so where you've got your rotation um, and also dorsiflex um, is always really stiff after. But other yeah. than that, I said to her, do you think my body looks in a bad state? She said, I can't believe you've run what you have and you've gone through this. And she said, actually, it's in a really good state. And I came out a little bit stiff, woke up this morning and felt fine. And actually, it's really helped. So she worked on my hip flexors. She did all um, the stretching as well. And I did have a massage before I went and did my event at the weekend. I always feel if you do it a few days out, it just gets your body into that state to race. Um, so it's something that I've always factored in. I don't care about the cost. It's something that's kept me on the road. Physio, uh, I call it physio massage because it's a bit of both. I think it's good actually to, to factor it all in. Sometimes, you know, we spend so much money on trainers and mm. all the other bits of admin people overlook so yeah it's kind of, it's good advice that uh sam i really want to ask you all about your training it seems like the next um good question but before that we're all, we're in awe as well because we know what you've already done this year so could you tell a little bit well tell the story of your year so far to our listeners because it's been absolutely huge and incredible and we should put a, an asterisk here that sam mm. is not normal so if you're listening to this going <laughs> oh my god i feel like i feel useless like sam's been doing this for years and also she's she won't mind me calling her a little bit of a freak of nature she's there she knows um so just just to take it on board like this is just an amazing athlete an amazing lady and but no, no comparison is needed but tell us a little bit about yeah your amazing year you've had so far so this year kind of had to change because we weren't sure when the um, World Championship, um, I guess the qualifier race, which was the Anglo-Celtic plate, and I know, Eddie, you've done the ACP yourself before, we wasn't really sure when that was going to be. So originally I was planning to do a marathon, so it was going to be Manchester Marathon at the beginning of April. And then when the date was announced, because I'm also on the team management, which is where my late coach Norman also used to contribute to, so... I started to help support them. And when I found out that was going to be on the um, 3rd of April, it was a case of having to change my training. So I started the year with running the country to capital, getting a long race in. And I can honestly say the conditions were horrific. I hadn't even thought about doing the Grand Union Canal then. I just knew the back section of the Grand Union Canal. And let's just say heavy rain, uh, hypothermic. I don't remember much about the race. It was a mud bath. It was literally a sh stretch out to get to the race. And I look back at my face. I look at how gray I looked. I got there and I finished, but it was an accomplishment because I said, right, that's the first race of the year I've got through and I survived. Then I did a lot of cross country for the club. So I run for Belgrave Harriers and those were just little bits to keep me ticking over the training had gone really well over christmas and then my coach andy walling was working with me on the next target so the next target actually became the anglo-celtic plate and in order to do that we pushed my marathon forward so i found any marathon i could because seville was already booked up and i was struggling to get any type of place or communication so i found one in cheshire i have to say it wasn't enjoyable it was on alton park so it was the gp motor circuit so oh. where they take the bikes and it was like this you'd have loved it eddie because it was like running mountain uh, runs because of the hills and it got to the point i think i was effing and jeffing most of the time around it yeah. for <laughs> four hills the last one was up like this and i'm saying do you know what i love lats but i'm really getting to the point i absolutely hate lats and it's got a chicane and everything and i ran 248 and i was in, i'm confident i was in pb shape then so i knew as long as i could hold my form together when i got to perth which was where we did the anglo-celtic play i was selected for the england team we i mean obviously the scottish are so strong there as well but we had some pretty good british athletes both the male and female and at that time i'd started with team hour seven so team hour seven was set up in january and i'd already been in discussion with mike stops one of the founders who's also a gb 24 hour runner yeah. and he asked me about joining i didn't really if i'm honest know too much about it but what <clears> i knew was because I, because i respected him as a person really liked him lovely guy i said yes anything i can help because it was a new business venture for him and that's really the start of when i started to work with his wife on the psychology piece um, i was talking to him about training and i felt there was this little group of trusted athletes as well and I liked all the athletes they'd selected um, I'm not sure what it was based on probably performance and other factors 
um, and none of us really were big on social media so the great thing about it is they do all your social media which is actually Natalie White and Robbie Britton and a few <laughs> others so that does help um, so I started um, working with them on nutrition so I knew I had to change something because for years I've underfueled, not intentionally but just because I find food really hard and when I'd done the British record at the 100 mile last year I, I scathed through it I remember having a really bad period where I felt nauseous unwell um, I, I just felt awful a few days after and I said right I've got to change things so I went in for everything changed the nutrition and just said even if we could increase it by 25 grams and Robbie gave me some recommendations of some of the precision fuel um, I tried to cut down the amount of gels because again that was giving me blisters on my mouth um, and just little and often and Mike bless him um, actually crewed me so Mike Stocks gave me the food and Robbie said don't give her anything else that she has asked for you just give her what's on the plan <laughs> hide, the, hide the shoes because I've got a habit of deflection because Looking at my trainers and changing them anything I did have a lot of wee stops because I was obviously getting given more fluid than I'd normally take on yeah. but Joe Joe Murphy my um teammate from uh team hour seven she's she's just like me a bit feral she said oh you'll get used to it and you know I ran it really well I felt comfortable she obviously got me towards the end but to come in second um after having run that marathon having like um such a hard year last year with my coach dying getting my training back in in uh, to a plan um, I felt elated because it was a PB for a start and then I knew from the marathon to the 100k the distance was going to increase so I'd always booked the um, 100 mile, mile track race you get a taste for it I actually don't enjoy running around the track I'm just going to be clear here I find it quite monotonous but it was a different track it was closer so I thought okay that's three weeks time the 100k is the build up so this is the thing my miles are a lot less now than what they've ever been um, based on the fact that if you race enough and I'm a prolific racer and yeah. you're confident about your ability you bounce off the last race so that's technically your last long run so having done the 100k I knew when it came to the uh, track 100 there was some great stars there there was Camille there was um, Sorokin so Alexandra was there there was a few other athletes to IHOA so that I knew on a good day we, we would be dueling um, there was also Dominika from Europe as well from Poland and a really classy field, but I told myself, um, you can do this. So that's basically how I went into that race. And then we used the same fueling strategy again. What exactly did you do between the 100K and the 100 miles? Because three weeks. I did that 100K and my, it's a lap course, um, yeah. just over a mile, isn't it, per <clears throat> lap? And my quads were probably the sorest they've ever been because you're running in the same direction aren't you after that 100k I remember the pain but how what did you do between that 100k and 100 miles only three weeks so I had a couple of days off um I did feel quite stiff mainly sitting on the plane to get back home um and it did take quite a bit out of me the 100k I say did um I felt so strong after a couple of days I went back running and then I, I did that week I had a two hour run on the Sunday. I didn't do any effort based training. It was just ticking over. So what I call jolly jogging and it's a lot with the dogs as well um, and just jogging slow. And then the week after I went back to training. So um, a typical week for me would be track Tuesday like most of us do. Um, and then I would have easy running and then I'd have maybe an effort session that would be on a Saturday or a race. And then Sunday would be a long run. So I'm probably clocking anything between um, 60 to 80 miles a week years ago I would have done um probably close to 110 to 120 and I think when you get more confident and you do cross training you don't need to do it and then yeah the, the week after I was back to the track do you do a lot of cross training you talked about the gym I've seen pictures of yours. um didn't mm. until last year and then I that was another thing that I did um after having a back fracture you'll probably be aware that um I went to the comrades I knew I had a back problem but I didn't know how significant it was that was in 2019 so I spent um, 11 months recovering from that and then lockdown hit so I used the two years or so that we were on and off in and out of races where we couldn't do much just to stay fit lost an opportunity to do the 24 hour twice because of COVID and rather than get complacent I went and did some life coaching tried to give myself some other uh, something else to f focus on and then just continued to train and then when everything opened back up again I felt ready to race so in a theory, I think it did us all the world of good. As much as I'd have loved to have raced, I think having that stress-free of not racing and that um, worry of when you turn up to a, a line, that definitely helped. And obviously, 
I went in and started doing more conditioning work. That was the other eye opener last year. So I do strength work on my back, um, plyometrics, all the stuff that us runners don't do until we get injured. That's at least once a week. And then I do classes. So that'd be things like body pump, body combat, cycling. So the cycling bits, something I took on a static bike. I don't go outside mainly just because I run so much around here. <laughs> I'd get bored of the roots and I'd need to move again and I don't want to do that yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sounds great. It sounds really varied too. I think it's a good, mm, good thing. It. To and I also like you made a good point. I think when, you know, Craig, I've been running for quite a few years now and I don't think I need to, I never ever kind of did a hundred mile weeks unless it was a, mm. a big event as such, but um. I don't think I need to do those big weeks anymore. I, I'll probably no. do be somewhere similar to yourself between mm. 70 and 80 miles a week. Um, so, yeah, I think, like I say, that decade, whatever of endurance is just, it's just there. I'm really interested if we could rewind a little bit. It, mm. I've never done a, a hundred mile on a track. Is Am I right in thinking that you will say do some of it clockwise and you'll everyone will start running anti-clockwise? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, Someone said to me this weekend, what did you prefer out of the two races between the Grand Union and obviously which is the point to point race versus the track? The difference with the track, it is monotonous. However, you can see your aid more regularly. They turn you every four hours. Um, the downside is you can't hide. People can see you. Um, yeah. For the race this year, we had terrible wind. And I mean, again, we talk about the effing and jeffing that was going on. Ah, this wind, I'm fed <laughs> up with it. And, you know, you watch the dropout rate. It's pretty significant because what it does to your body um, on your hip flexors, your ITB, all different parts of your body. And you have to be careful the type of trainers you wear because depending on the track, if it's a sprinter's track, they're relatively hard. If it's um, not a sprinter's track, they tend to be a bit more bouncy. Yeah. So they really do vary. This was an A-graded track. It was good, but it's quite well-worn. And I did get to the point that when you're looking around, because the weather was so grey, um, and it was so windy. I started looking in the food box, and the th you know where people are yeah. throwing things, thinking, "How on earth is he eating pizza? Who's eating those goo um, trifles and um, cheesecakes? God, someone, someone's got an appetite." And I'm thinking, I can just about manage a, a quarter of a marmite sandwich. Um, so yeah, you have to use all these deflection tactics. And I did sometimes put music in, although I wasn't listening to it, basically to. Um, not block off my crew but i knew that there was the habit because it was my best friends to chat to them and that yeah, was also in the now. instruction what are you talking about what are you talking about we're not allowed to chat <laughs> yeah we're not allowed to chat and then i put my sunglasses down like this so they couldn't see that my eyes were really tired because sometimes when the light changes because we started at six it was still coming up light you're exhausted the last thing you want is someone to say to you oh you look exhausted or are you feeling yeah. okay you're gri grimacing because actually that gives you a reason to think oh do i look really bad mm -hmm. and then i started looking at the toilets thinking i could get some shelter in there and i thought <laughs> i better get out soon because someone's going to notice i've been in here too long and there is this classic picture of me opening the toilet i don't know who went in there but poor old drew and i mean poor drew had to clean that toilet you would just seen the look of horror Ooh. whatever happened the door got shut and i went into the next one i thought do you know what i don't need the toilet that much <laughs> <laughs> but you had a super Love race toilet. what was it like running with camille heron around that track it was good and obviously with alex that's the second time i've run with him i mean it does put you off your own pace a little bit because it's not that you feel jealous they're running at such speed they had different agendas and yes. you feel like you're actually moving quite slow but i wasn't i was doing just slightly shy of eight minute miling because i'd agreed what pace i was going to do what i was attempting was the 12 hour and then with the 12 hour would come the um, british record which was my own one i was targeting so you have to try and stay in the game of your own race but it was lovely she was very good after she didn't fit, obviously finish the race but she congratulated me alex went for the six hour he was always there to do another record and was flying um i just did feel a little bit jealous he was going really fast does it end up being more of lots of individual races or do you still find there's a few people who were duking it out for the win do you know what in a way for me personally i felt less pressure because there was other people that could win but 
when people started peeling off the track, all of a sudden my game face came on and I thought, <laughs> I'm going to annihilate this. I am not putting up with this. I'm winning yeah. it. I want my trophy back. No, it changed because, you know, from where you almost give up, because you do have these moments where you think, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this to myself? I, you know, this is a long way. Do I really need to do it? And then when people start dropping out, like obviously James um, didn't have a great race, Kat didn't have a great, a great race. And it's great when there's more people because there's someone to talk to, but you do get told off you get told to focus i know hillary did say to me you talk too much sam and i thought oh god i'm getting told <laughs> off here better shut up um and also you get tired that you don't want to go in the second lane because every distance makes a difference mm -hmm. if you're going to go, keep going out and you just start drifting a little bit for a while you're not really with it and then the next week oh god i'm in a race i need to keep control of all this um you it's just every time camille and alex came past you or did they run past you um, so there's a track attica and I'm glad because there was a race I did a few years ago. It was one of uh, the ones in Gloucester where someone kept shouting track and do you know what? It's the most annoying yeah. thing, someone yeah. shouting it because when you're tired, although you want to swear at them, you just think I can't move. I can't move quick enough. It's actually just easier to go past people. So I would never shout at a slower person. I just think if you've got the strength to go past, the consensus is you just run past. So Alex didn't treat anyone any different. Um, Camille didn't treat anyone any different and I certainly wouldn't everyone deserved to be on that track that was on there on that day and what I like about the Centurion events and you'll know this that they limit the numbers because actually if there's too many people on the track it becomes awkward having to get into lane three lane two keep swapping around but yeah we all overtook each other and then when there was only four of us left on the track it made it a lot easier to so move on to the Grand yeah, Union Canal race yeah. well first yeah. off congratulations taking the yeah. outright win is it 25 hours of 45, 45 minutes yeah awesome it was we just said in the podcast because we read your result out for this week's mm -hmm. show saying i think i'm a bit i follow a lot of ultra races um mm -hmm. i think you're the first woman to won to win uh what i'd call like a major league ultra race outright i mean we've all won like lower ultra grade races where there's not been a massive field probably at some point as women um but uh, who who um, compete in ultras? But I think this is the first one I've seen where you smash the men's field in a mm -hmm. race as well. Would you agree, Sam? I, I do you know I didn't even go for the outright win. It would have been nice. So I wrote three targets down. I do this before my race. I put them in a drawer, have a little look at them before I go away or I get in the car. And the target was to get the course record, which was um, 27 or just under 27 and a half hours. I knew that was I was capable. But as you know, Eddie, you have to be able to run for a long time. Anything can happen, whether it's a 50 mile, let alone. Well, yeah. And it ended up 147 miles because we had diversions that went off of the road. And it was a real struggle to get through certain sections overgrown. We had the humidity of the heat. Um, and I just thought, block it all out. This is what I do before a race. I got a away from um, Birmingham because honestly the canal really does stink uh, the water is stagnant uh, when there's dead rats at the side of the road while you're running it kind of tells you that if they don't like the water you don't want to go in it um, <laughs> there were some beautiful sections I didn't even start right at the front I just thought take it as it is just enjoy it and the only thing I would say is my aid stations at the start were a little bit too far out they were kind of 15 miles apart but again we didn't know what to expect because normally I wouldn't eat a lot but I because it was a warm day I did need a lot more fluid so mm -hmm. if you have your own crew you can take off of their stations the water so there was a few top-ups I needed um, but just in general my game plan was just to run it and win the ladies race and I had no idea where people were behind um, I wore a tracker for my team just to make sure. So I used open tracking. I, I like to stay safe. And then you can pick people up from 65 miles. And I don't do it because I'm not capable of running the distance. I do it for safety. And it was lovely because I could spend um, uh, some time with Ellie, who came second in the track. 100 so it was really good for her um i think it was nice for us to spend time and she offered to pace me so we ran for 30 odd miles and then i had um matt one of my friends run another similar distance i mean the poor guy ended up with the darkness so someone gets the graveyard shift originally it was going to be mike stocks but he um picked up a niggle when he fell over we all do stupid things running don't we <laughs> gets worse as you get older you trip over invisible rocks um and he just felt that um it would be too much which i totally understand to run sort of 20 25 miles with me so i ended up breaking the last section down with 
my very good friend that crews a lot for me, Trevor, um, and then Dom, who's one of the other founders from uh, Team Hour 7. He did eight miles with me. So it felt like a family that I was sharing it with. And to have that company through the night when it is so dark, and there are times where, um, I don't know if either of you have ever run on the Grand Union, it's so narrow. You're literally on the water's edge or you're running on gravel. So if you don't pick your feet up, there was a couple of times where I got a pull back because I nearly went over and oh my goodness. shuffling. <laughs> yeah, and saying, oh God, I hate this gravel. And then you'd be running over grass. You'd have all these grass lumps that you just trip up. Then you've got all the overgrown bushes. So it's a real mixed terrain. And and the laughing thing is, I actually wore vapor flies. Well, wow. and I got them I out there. Yeah. Don't, don't. I got them out the box the night before. People would say, "Why would you check just put them?" I'm so used to those trainers, but I've got to say, in um, hindsight, I'd have probably put the Hocker Rincons or some easy tr uh, trainer to start okay. with, and then I'd have probably put them on towards the end because I've never run the Grand Union Canal. I, that was my technically that was my first recce. Yeah. <laughs> so I've never done I've never done any of it before, apart from the back end section, which comes comes into the country to capital. So I learned a valuable lesson. But honestly, I wouldn't change it. I was very tight. My hip flexors were tight. I, I told myself I had invisible legs. I played mind games with myself. I looked at the tracker app or someone told me oh the next person that is using a tracker because there was about nine of us looks about three miles away and if I'm honest with you they clearly weren't because they finished three hours behind I was so worried so it put I put the boot in it and when um, <laughs> Ian who I'm <laughs> running with at 70 up to 70 miles he I just said to his crew he needs to get to the end this is what we've made a pack together we've run quite a lot together so we had a good chat Ian and I also ran a little bit on the track so Ian Hammett's done quite a lot of long races and I know he's a very classy talented um, runner as well he's done sort of 14 hours for uh, I think it was the Thames path so we did a lot of running together just for company because it stopped him running off fast and it also meant that I had a bit company for someone to talk to so we spent a lot of time just high-fiving talking to this is the great thing about long races you see people out there and they think what are you doing and when you tell them they're run, you're running to London we we agreed as long as we go faster than the barge boats then we know we're doing well <laughs> so we kept looking and going we're moving faster than the boats we're all right Ian we're, we're doing well and we talk to them when they're coming through they go what are you doing we're oh we're going for a long run we're running to Paddington they look and they think you're insane and actually you get driven on that yeah. yeah it is disbelief so that's how I kind of run my race so I had to put quite a lot of company and then um I actually picked up the pace in the last mile so this is why I had my friend Trevor who trains with me sometimes I think Don was scared because he thought he was there to witness what I did on the track and he said how on earth can you run for nearly 14 hours and then all of a sudden the last few miles you pick up the pace from seven minute mile into 625 <laughs> and I knew where I was in London because I knew that these gates were coming on the the um path and my poor friend was running with a selfie stick. And I said, I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> off I went. When I could see the little yellow jacket in the distance, I thought, that's got to be, got to be. And, yeah, it turned out to be the finish. So I knew I was really close, and I put the boot in, Fantastic. lifted my legs. <laughs> and what is that? So over the, over the, the 25 hours and 145 miles or 47 miles, it's mm. like it's about 10 and a half minute mile or something, isn't it? Roughly mm -hmm. average pace. But so yeah, yeah, you were saying six and a half minute mile in there. What what was your play, your fluctuation in pace? So I actually find it harder to run slower. You'll hear a lot of people say that, but um the block between sort of 70 and 90 I found quite hard because I was really lethargic. I was um a little bit deflated because it was hot, humid, and I was all over the place. And I knew I needed to pick myself up, but from a pace standpoint, I stopped looking at my watch. And then when I felt, when I could start running a little bit quicker, it felt so much more comfortable back in the eights. Oh. Um, so I just thought, I'll do what I need to do. And I realized I wanted to get a little bit closer, if I'm honest with you, to the 24 hours. But I knew it was a big ask having come off the back of lots of racing the last few weeks. Um, so I just thought, right, the game now is to get to the finish. And I knew um, when we went past, it's um, just around 100k, Ian and I, the front leader, who was going off like a rocket. Um, I knew that I was then in the lead. Um, so for me, it was about picking up my pace to make sure I made the gap as big as possible. Am I right? Is it kind of the Paddington area of London where it finishes? Yeah, it start, uh, finishes at Little Venice. Yeah, it's quite nice around there, actually. I know people, I've actually done a race, uh, the Canal Canter, which 
he's around Birmingham and I can uh, confirm mm. the smell of the canals is, <laughs> is not great but wait, when you get down to Paddington it's like well, it's really it's really really pleasant around there's here some, I have to say in the Grand Union there's some really pretty parts like around Leamington Spa you've got little bits around Northampton there are some great parts yeah. and then there's also some dark parts and you also in the night go through so many dark areas where the tree line is over it is literally pitch black and all yeah. you can see is eyes so that's why even as a guy <laughs> i don't think i'd want to run on there on my own if you saw the type of characters you've either got the fishermen that don't move the rods out of the way you've got yeah. these unprecedented parties going on and people look like they're happy clappy god knows what's going on yeah. then you've got um the spiritualists that come running after you um we yeah. had a little bit of that we palmed them off to ian ellie and i which was quite funny but in general most people are really friendly which is what i like so i mean for me the experience of doing a point to point race it's quite good to do yeah. that every so often like the thames path i enjoy the outside the fresh air and the challenge and for me it was about how quick could i get to that finish line and I now have already reflected and thought, I spent too long at that age place. I shouldn't have yeah. sat down when I had that pot noodle. I didn't even like that pot noodle. <laughs> I think Robbie was more worried about it getting launched into the canal. <laughs> and I did really well at <laughs> making sure I ate all my age. And then I think certain sections where they were more runnable, I should have definitely done that. Um, yeah. Should have run a bit more. But you know what? Hindsight's a great thing. At that time, that's what I needed to do. And a little bit of walking, moving forward, feeling confident, because actually that's the longest I've ever run because I've done a 24 hour event and run 139 miles. That was 145 plus the diversions. It worked out just over 147 miles. And again, you have to suck it up. People were complaining, but you know, pathways get shut off. They've, I've had diversions on the 10th path before. I've had to run in poor conditions. You take it for what it is. I'm really elated and to then come away with the win and see my name on the board first. But my friends celebrate more because I feel so exhausted. All I want to do is get <laughs> yeah. home and lay down horizontal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, it's a race that really, since I started running and thinking about running longer, the Grand Union Canal, yeah, I must admit, it's something that I would really love to do. That point of point it seems like quite a symbolic journey mm. what was it for you why, why the Grand Union Canal so I've wanted to do it for years and years and I talked to Norman um, my uh, coach that passed away last year and there was a year that it was on I think it was the 2019 that he said no go and do the Conrades which again is another iconic race so we agreed to do it in a few years time and it fell on my birthday that year on the 25th of May and this year, because he passed away, um, I knew he passed away on the 4th of June. I ran, obviously, the start was the 3rd of June. So I actually wanted to run it even more so this year. So I'm, I'm very persuasive with my coach, Andy, who was working very closely with Norman anyway, and he's my um, former physio as well. He, um, he said, all right, then. He said, only you would push that, you know, and he said someone like you would do these amount of races, but because he could see that I was recovering and there was still that question mark after the 10, uh, sorry, the 10 to us, after the track 100, because the recovery went so well, I knew that the race was on, but if at any point I didn't feel right up into the lead, I would have walked away, but it became more significant because it was the eve or the death of my coach. So when I finished and got through the line, I did it for him because he'd have been very proud, Norman. Um, so that was why it was symbolic for me. Plus, it's one of those races, as Eddie said, that lots of people do. And I've had it on my tick list and it's kind of on my doorstep, you know, rather than having to travel abroad, having to take everything with me. It was a lot easier just to drive up to Birmingham. I've got all my friends that can see me along the route and I know a lot of people. So I knew finishing in London, it's easy to get back home. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that sounds that wonderful. Yeah, what a story. Eddie and I chatted uh, be before we came on air. Uh, uh, you'd visualise that it's pancake flat, but yeah, do you know what the elevation was by the time you got to London? I don't, but there was the diversions that we did. We were climbing, and actually I remember saying to Ian, this is more like the South Downs. What are we doing on this grass section? I said, it's going uphill. I said, I'm walking. I said, I'm not putting up this. I'm going to do what <laughs> Drew said to me with the Wendover Woods, brace the hills, walk the 14-minute mile. So we did do a little tiny bit of walking, and then I started to get back to running. But it's not flat. And also, the other thing is you have to be switched on with the navigation because even if you've got it on your watch, one, there's diversions, then you've got to go over the yeah. locks. So you climb over the black locks and then back down. And then you can be on one side of the canal and then you move over to the the, yeah. the, the other side. So if you don't go over the bridges, um, and I'm talking about road bridges or certain sections correctly, you'll be off somewhere else. 
So it's not flat and you've got obviously this mixed terrain. So you've really got to think about your shoes, what you're wearing, because you've got the hard section at the start, which is hardcore. It's more cementy type. Then you've got stones. Then you've got grass, which is overgrown. Then you've got gravel. Then you've got road. So it's a real mixture. Um, so, yeah, it's not flat. But I don't think they had the those uh, terrains in the Nike lab when they were developing the Day of the Flies sound. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think they're, at, do you know, because they're brand new, I'm looking at them now and they're black. And I looked at the bottom of the tread, I thought I might even get another 100 miles out of them. They were brand new. They, they arrived the day before. But I thought I need to get one with the most tread. <laughs> I love it. I, <laughs> I love it. I run on my box. toes. Out, out of the, the box. box and yeah did what which one of our guests they had some vapor flies and they resold them uh put some trail grip on the bottom of them i can't remember who it was now Brilliant. one of our guests did that so you're not, <laughs> you're not a strava person then sam i don't use strava and i'll tell you why i don't use strava um mainly from a safety standpoint because people get to see where you're running all the time and also um i feel a little bit i don't want to be egotistical about and I'm, I'm just saying this is how i feel i don't want people to see what i'm doing not because i'm trying to be secretive but i feel a little bit embarrassed about it sometimes um i let my friends do my promo for me it's really silly but i always feel that i can do better it's this whole desire as a um, long distance runner to try and improve on yourself and i feel a bit overwhelmed by it all so i don't use Strava for that reason i just post things post events so when people do a big build up before a race they start putting their pictures of their race stuff occasionally i've done it but i don't want that pressure and that anxiety so for me to get into race mode i go stealth mode very low key because i don't want to know one uh, deal with my own expectations is hard enough but other people that disappointment because people have an expectation when you turn up you know i'm a marked woman when i turn up to the track when i turn up to races that people know oh sam's gonna win there are times that you just don't have it in you yourself and it's disappointing enough your own let alone having other people sort of say oh i'm really sorry and i don't want to try and write war and peace why i didn't achieve something so that's why i don't use strava how do you log your training then old school old school, then old school. i i get given um training each week it's sent to me on whatsapp because my coach is now um working for manchester united um so he lives up north um he sends me my training over and i work out who i can do some of that training with because 90 percent of the time i'm running on my own i try to make an effort to drive to where i used to live in marlow to go to the track just so i've got company um he sends it to me and then every sunday i send him my training how many miles i've done because he'll give me run for 45 minutes uh this track session da 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 and then i'll tell him how many miles what the minute per mile is so he knows the fitness level and how i felt so he gets a little bit of the classes i do the run that i do and how i felt and just the end of the week and after races we then have a talk as well so yeah i, I send it to him on email and norman used to put it on a spreadsheet <laughs> Fancy. Fancy. <laughs> fancy fancy spreadsheets yeah i know my stuff goes on a spreadsheet and so does my training and then if i want to race i'll tell um, my coach andy what races i want to do he'll have a pep talk and say no you've got a race the week before <laughs> or isn't that a bit much and i say no it's not and then we have a little bit of banter and then we agree and then i think sometimes you know Am I uncoachable? Probably sometimes, but it's actually really good to have an advisor. And that's how our coaching relationship works, where he gives me positive advice and reminds me of, you know, your body, you need to have rest as well. And I feel disappointed if I let him down, which is why it's really important to have a good coaching relationship. And then I've got my crew that I really trust. I go for the same people that I know can deliver. I feel sorry for them, though, everyone, because obviously I race a lot. <laughs> <laughs> how would you um that's not really coaching i suppose but with a race like this there's definitely going to be sleep deprivation would you mm. experience that in training or do you not think there's a benefit to that um no i i tend to do deprivation of food actually to train myself to um not have food for a while just in case the inevitable happens although i take food on but as far as deprivation i've done a couple of long runs in the night um but i don't really need to do it now and my training never really goes over 50k if i've got a big event the longest i'll probably run for is 50k yeah. if you do double days maybe 20 and 25 individual days but i would never go for longer because those are miles in your legs that, legs that you can save for racing so i don't really need to do the um sleep deprivation maybe for the 48 hour when i um, attempt that yeah. well, I I'll have that, a gloucester, that gloucester's got yeah. the 
48 hours you you go, are you gonna are you thinking of that i'm potentially thinking of it i was actually thinking about attempting 48 hours next year anyway so it's quite funny it's come up Ooh. um i just have to have two race crews because no one's going to want to attempt to do it for 48 hours <laughs> two race my crews. friends get more exhausted Hot noodles maybe yeah. more than just a gel <laughs> what about hallucinations going to be twice the hallucinations do you experience that kind of thing if you sleep deprived so, when I did the first um, Thames Pass, I was told when you get to about 70 miles, you're going to hallucinate, you're going to get this, you're going to get that. So I built and factored in and I did do some long runs through the night in the dark, getting used to the difference in um, light sensitivity and none of it happened. But I have bonked in races before. I, um, there was a year that all of the top runners, it was 2018, I ran the Thames Pass again. Myself and the two Norwegian ladies pulled out because I had a terrible stomach and it was that case of over drinking because it was so hot. I realised when I got to Reading, I was in trouble because I kept drinking and drinking and it didn't matter how much Coke I had. I couldn't keep anything down and I was also incredibly exhausted and I haven't felt anything like it. So you kind of have to listen to your body and sleep deprivation is definitely going to happen. And I call it sleeping. You're, you're running while you're sleeping. Um, you just take a little bit of caffeine, you calm your mind down, you chill out a little bit more and you just run through it and then you come out the other side. And I knew that I'd get my third win, so I call it, the longer the race, I get a second win. I got it in the te uh, track 100, where all of a sudden my legs start working again. <laughs> and then I had it in this race where I had a really good start section. I hate the middle section of races. It's just the way I run, so I tend to run a little bit slower. And then I got a uh, second win. And then the third win came towards the end, the last couple of miles, um, just because the end is in sight. So I, um, I do psychology in my own head. I have a little pep talk with myself. I don't write mantras or anything like that. I just tell myself, you know what to expect of your body. Keep plugging through. You're going to come out the other side. So if you know that you can expect that, then you give yourself a little bit of a break. That's what I do most days, Sam, just to get through the day. A pep talk. <laughs> come on, Eddie. You can get through this. Almost eight o'clock. You can put them to bed. <laughs> Uh, what's, um, we talked a little bit about your training, your recovery, your incredible powers of recovery. What on like a normal training week when Andy WhatsApps you like your training and stuff, have you got like a favorite session? People love these sort of things. Favorite session when you're like, yeah, I love that one. Or something that you always do that you know when you're fit and you're ready to race a session that you do. I wouldn't say I've got a favourite session. I'd just say I like the track, even though I hate, I love to hate the track. Um, the track sessions are normally with a lot younger people and they're a lot faster. And when I know I can get into the front group, then I know I'm doing really well. So I actually like the track. It's short, sweet, and it's over really quickly if I'm not doing tempo sessions and it's company. So for me, if I know I've run well on there, it really sets off my week. So that's always on a Tuesday. I'll go to Wickham Phoenix, although I run for Belgrave, it's too far away to go to London where I live. Um, so I love that one. And I also like it when some of my friends might be around for my long run. So it means I won't run with music, uh, a two or a three hour run. I've got someone to talk to. I love chatting. Anyone that doesn't know me, <laughs> all I do is talk. I talked all through the race last weekend. Um, so for me, the long run, obviously and the track session and then the rest of it's all easy stuff so i'll go out sometimes with my music and i'll listen to songs that i feel are quite uplifting clubbing tunes i i sing to the words i must look uh, such a weirdo running along the road singing to myself love a bit <laughs> of club music i relive the day yeah, my exactly. when... happy songs happy songs mm. <laughs> um, yes. what does the rest of the year look like now sam for you so this week is obviously easy. I'll back get, yeah, get back to running easy this week, probably Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and then next week I'll have probably a long run and obviously get back to track. And then I've got a couple of weeks until I plan to do probably a 50K in July, just ready for the championship. So that's for the uh, GB 100K. I chose to do that over the 24 hour. I um, qualified for both, but they're two, three weeks apart. And whilst I know I could do them, I don't think the GB management would be happy. So I had to select one and yeah. I went for the world champs in Berlin because while I've still got speed um, and I still want to knock my 100K time down a little bit more, I've gone for Berlin and that's going to be on the 27th of August. And yes, yeah, so as I said, July will be a 50K, a couple of 10Ks before I go and hit the world champs. And then I'm off to a training camp with Team Hour 7 and that will be with Robbie, Matt White, and the athletes. We're there in July. We're over um, in Italy. 
so that would be quite nice to meet up with everyone some warm weather training and then I'm going to look at getting a uh, London Marathon in in October. And you never know, I might squeeze a 24-hour in before the end of the year. <laughs> oh, wow, I'm exhausted. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how things are. But I've had, like you said, a phenomenal year. I feel in the best shape at 43 years old than I've ever felt. And all of this is to do with strength and conditioning, believing in your team, believing in yourself, changing your nutrition. So I've literally changed everything last year. And the rewards are happening this year. So, and it's, you know, it's good to talk to people, get advice, listen to people, take yeah. it on. Do you think you'll go back and defend your title 2023? Grand Union the grand, I don't know. Um, I'm thinking 48 hour and possibly going back to the comrades. Um, I might leave it if it's going to stand for a little while. I think they're doing it the other way around and I don't fancy running to Birmingham if I'm honest. So maybe oh, no. the year after. I think there's so many other races and I just need to see how things go. Now we can travel a little bit more as well. There's a couple of other races I'd like to do, but I would definitely like to go back and get in the top 10 of the comrades because I ran with a back fracture. I was in agony whilst I came back as first British lady. All I can say is iconic race, really enjoyed my experience, just not my back pain. Um, and it was awful. So I'd like to try and improve on that and get into the sixes for yeah. the um for the race so we'll see i'll start planning my 2023 racing um probably after the world champs august september time and obviously the world champs 24 hour will be next year so that will definitely be a qualifying fine target that i want and it's spread out enough to potentially do the 100k as well which will be for the europeans it sounds amazing i'm tired <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i've still got a job as well to do and my kids yeah. and my dogs yeah i still do everything else so anyone that says they never have time you'll find time for the things that you really enjoy and that's important that's the main thing that keeps me going you must have some amazing time management i just don't complain i just get on with it and i also cook um, food for my son because my daughter's uh, 20 now my son's 14 but teenagers are actually harder than young kids I'm telling you they're hard work and he's very demanding as well very particular about what he likes and trying to get into bed is now my problem so I don't sleep enough but that is something that I'm working on for this year so the goal this year is better sleep last year was nutrition and the early part of this year and getting my training better and also strength and conditioning but my one thing that I really do need to nail is sleep we could all do with more sleep not enough I think. Yeah. Should we move on to our quick five, Eddie? Mm, your favourite bit, Gary. Okie doke. You've just crushed your massive race. What would be your recovery treats and Netflix choice? If you're going to waste any time, if you're going to put your... <laughs> So my um, treat always post-race, and actually I do do it a little bit pre-race, chip butty, salt and vinegar in it, ketchup, and a nice lemonade and lime cordial. That is my go-to food. Oh, yeah. Love it. Lime cordial. Love I absolutely love Love it. Cordial. Yeah, super refreshing yeah. sunshine. What would your superpower be? Um, God, what would I want? To be able to run faster. <laughs> <laughs> turbo, a little turbo behind you. Or be invisible, actually. Yeah, be invisible would be quite nice. Be a fly on the wall. Yeah, I'd like the idea. I'd be just disappearing for, for a while. That would be good. Um, top tip for juggling kids and running and training for ultras. I think you summed it up, time management. And obviously, I started doing it when my kids got a little bit older. Um, it's about having a good network as well. I rely quite a lot on my friends, which they wouldn't even think twice about. Um, I've always had an open door policy. I give back a lot of time to them. Um, I coach kids as well over the road. So I think when someone sees you as a giving person, they're happy to give your time. And they love nothing more than seeing me achieve. So I'm very fortunate to build a good crew around me. So you build that support network is what I'm saying. And I don't have um, the kid's dad because he passed away um, when my kids were very young. So obviously you rely on families, friends and so forth. So I like to give back as well. So that's one key thing. And the other is... Um, I used to run at four o'clock in the morning while the kids were asleep. Obviously, there's always someone that would be at home. Um, just finding the time. I don't get stressed over it. I just accept this is the situation. And I've always worked through my kids when they when I was um, pregnant. I worked right up to the last minute. Back in the day, you only got 12 weeks off. So I went back to work. And because I'm incredibly independent, I've just managed it around conference calls, early mornings, nighttime jogs, and if I needed childcare, I'd get the cover or when they were in, um, uh, young enough, I'd go put them into a preschool so I could run then. So you just manage it, time management. 
it's always a tricky question this because people tend to forget but mm. is there a song you remember listening to last or a particular song that you're fond of um god which one would i listen to at the moment i like um when i because obviously we've had really bad weather i like listening to lady gaga rain on me because it's quite an emotional <laughs> song and again it brings that happy and wanting to go out and dance and yeah. when it rains it, because i get really annoyed because it's raining really hard it's almost like if you sing it in your head it rains harder <laughs> and it's it's more about pushing boundaries because you know that when the weather is really bad if you can get yourself out in those conditions you can do anything yeah. so i was actually listening to it when i was doing the track 100 so that's one of my favorite songs awesome. Have you uh, heard Lady Gaga? She's uh, the Top Gun theme tune. Not yet. No. I didn't. I did watch Top Gun though. I did watch it, but I didn't. I missed it because I was too busy looking at Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> he looks hot, eh? He's got hot. He did look hot. For some, he's got better with age. Six-year-old. That was amazing. yeah, amazing. And that was actually my treat. Although sitting in a cinema on Sunday when the seats you can't put your feet under them. Oh, I'm only I five thought, foot yeah. three. So they need to Keep they need to build runners cinemas which put your feet up we've got recliners near us in oh the, stop in it. the audience it's fantastic i love it i just fall asleep <laughs> pretty quick you've logged into airbnb <clears throat> there's only two options left for your accommodation mm. one is it one is a beach holiday and one is a canal boat what would you choose <laughs> go for a canal boat even though i've done the grand union canal i'd pick one of the nice ones that are proper plush that have yeah. got their as well and it depends on what time of year it is if you ask me to do that in winter i might have gone for the beach holiday beach but holiday. yeah looking at some of the canal boats i'd have probably said the canal boat i'm not really a beach person i'd go canal boat what about you ready mm, it depends if i had the kids <laughs> <laughs> Far away. canal boat would be uh well, i don't know they're a bit older now maybe or maybe a little mix maybe the canal boat to a nice little beach holiday uh i do like i do like i went on a canal boat holiday actually with a mate when i was at school it was lovely and then you have something to do as well so you get off the boat and you do the yep. locks but then you can just chug along seeing the world go past you go for a run along the canal exactly sounds lovely sam thank oh. you so much for coming on the show <laughs> you and your amazing powers of recovery we wish <laughs> you all the best of luck for the rest of the year we will be following you reading your results out with awe um and uh yeah don't come back too soon. Take it easy this week. Lots, I of, <laughs> Lots of chip butty. Yeah, chip butty. I really fancy a chip butty now. <laughs> yeah, me too. Chip butty, salt and vinegar, ketchup, and then if you're feeling really like pushing the boat out, put some mushy peas in as well. Whoa, that's crazy talk. You've won lunch today. <laughs> Best of luck, Sam, with everything. Thank you again for coming on the podcast. Pleasure. Okay, take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Wow, thanks, Sam. Uh, we were a bit speechless, aren't we? When she was like, she did the, I think we're talking to like five days after the GUCR, and she's like, oh, yeah, I've been to the gym and I'm going to be yeah. back running. And we're like, oh, uh. <laughs> so dedicated. I, I, so dedicated. I think the thing with me, Gary, this is why I've never made it, is that I don't want to when I've done these massive races. I, I don't like want to be that driven. <laughs> me too. Was, I'm like, can't you? She was ready to go. Yeah, amazing. What a lady. So driven and determined. We're excited to see if she can improve on that British record um, and what else she's going to uh, plan for not only this year, hopefully feet up a bit for the rest of this year, um, but I don't think she is because she's going on to do uh, British 100K, isn't she, um, at the World Champs. So best of luck to everything that she does this year. We'll look forward to uh, catching up with her again, no doubt, in the future. Upcoming races, Eddie. Uh, these are a couple that... You can still enter there, not this weekend. One's this weekend, actually. Silk Up puts Weir, which I will be towing the line. Oh at. my God, the entries are going to go through the roof. Yeah. You get the chance not only to run the Silk Up puts Weir, like yeah. in a famous English trail, but to meet Gary, <laughs> Gary from the podcast. He'll also be running, signing autographs at the Cheer Charge booth from 4 yeah. to 5 p.m. Like, I need my cheer charge. Yeah, I wonder what my kid's going to be. Should I get my cheer, cheer charge uh, t shirt on? But I'm doing the 45 miler, but there's also a 100k one. And my friend Aaron, actually, he's doing the 100k and he's doing the Lincoln 100 too. I just said, oh, we'd 
I just assumed we travel up together. We're both doing the 45 miler. But no, no, he's running all the way to Holy Island. So I hope, my goodness, I hope he gets there in time. He beats the tide. That's bit, it's, it's obviously, the, the, I love it, the jeopardy of the race. And this is probably why it's starting at uh, half 12 or one in the morning, because you have to get, keep in mind the tide times at Holy Island. And they also, some people look at the, <clears throat> the, the cutoff time and think it's um, a bit tight. But they have to assume that something bad's going to happen on Holy Island, and they need emergency services to get on and off again. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. I was like, so, what's that? What's that? What's going to happen? This oh, is yeah. very nice. Yeah. I don't want to do this. Sorry. <laughs> something bad is going to happen once you get to the island, unless you get it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, Midsummer's Murders. <laughs> like something you watch on Netflix, Gary. Forty-five miles is plenty. Three weeks before, hundred k. Yeah. I hope he doesn't leave a bit of his slate. Like, District beans on the 100k course. I don't think he's a racer, Aaron. I think he's more for yeah, experience. Yeah. Um, so I don't think he's that concerned. But yeah, I love the I love the jeopardy last year of just trying to get there before the tide came in or went out, whichever or came in. Sorry. Um, but yeah, awesome, awesome race. So well, good luck to everybody who's towing the line. Hopefully, see somebody out there. Um, and also I noticed uh, well, UTMR. You still plenty of time to enter that race, Lizzie Hawker's race. And I'll be, again, my timeline. Lovely pictures from the training camp and all these. Uh, Facebook knows my, you know, got me sus for my algorithms. And I'm just being spoiled by all these lovely images. So if you fancy that race, yeah, go and check you out. Don't get, you don't get, I get on Facebook, I get period pants and uh, inappropriate, like, um, soft porn stories of books that people uh. read and stuff. <laughs> I start reading it thinking it's just something someone's posted and then it's like she met the she, she met the farrier not knowing that their lives would cross again and I start reading I'm like no no why am I reading it because then I'm like oh no now I've clicked on it yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's a self-fulfilling thing <clears throat> um no I don't get those kind of things <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. my personal preferences. Uh, we've also got uh, the Dales Runner Races, 16K on July the 16th. If you want to enter this, entries close on the 9th of July. They also have um, 20K and 40K options coming up. These look like great races. Um, go and have a look at those if you're looking for some long, uh, longer runs, maybe some longer supported runs if you're training for something bigger as well. So have you got penciled in for your holiday activities? Oh, it's a heavy mix. It's a heavy mix of uh, uh, lying by the pool, moving from the pool to the shade, back into the pool. I did a bit on... <laughs> as well as the hot jogging as i call it hot jogging <laughs> around the olive grove i brins also fashioned me my aqua jogging belt and we've got there was a swing tied to the tree so we've taken the swing off the tree and he's tied me into the pool so that <laughs> as the kids are it's, it's great holiday multitasking as the kids are like diving all around me blah, 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 i can i can do my aqua jog session Whoa. at the same time four miles some other smiles and Everybody's happy. Mum's just jogging up and down. And I've got some waterproof um, earphones, Bluetooth earphones. I can, you can't actually really see I've got them on. Pop those on. Kids think I'm looking after them. I'm not. I'm merrily oh, wow, just jogging good, away. Listen. So, yeah, that's another good little. If you're slightly injured, as I seem to be in 2022 constantly, um, or uh, it's great recovery because I didn't want to bring my bike and stuff and it's all just too much so yeah. it's, it means that I can do a little bit of recovery as well as not leaving the kids the kids are happy just dive bombing it over me until mum gets the raj and goes will you just give me five minutes in this pool <laughs> uh so yeah just hot jogging hot jogging around enjoying the holidays enjoying the sun enjoying different supermarkets <clears throat> we went in to oh, get I, love, our I love a holiday we supermarket in the marché. And even though it's the same, because we're so used to the French, it was different. There was a, we went a bit mad. The, the, the trolley was like absolutely, Yay. Rory called it his fault. It was that full. <laughs> we're like, not really sure we actually bought any meals. Just take <laughs> loads of snacks and dips. The best part of the holiday, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Low vegetable consummation, high snackage. Just Everything endless. brown or like, yellow. Yeah, brown. <laughs> Just the food, please. <laughs> so, yeah, nothing. I think, no, will we be back? We'll still be here. This time next week, I'll be able to give you <clears throat> more hot joggings updates. Cool. I might have made friends with the olive grove farmers by then. They probably will, um, probably on first name terms. Free olive oil. You're racing. You're going racing. It's, it's, it's not a race, Eddie. 100% not oh. a race. <laughs> 
Always a race, Gary. If uh, you check, you know, not that you'd be interested, that interest, but if my stro- <laughs> if my heart rate goes above 135 beats a minute, then I've I've cocked up. I've got to be yeah. park yeah. the ego in leave leave it in the car, and um, it's got to be pretty strict on the heart rate. I'm going to be mindful with my nutrition. Um, like the lakes um, on Sunday, I just munched my way through all of that the the chocolate that, that you got me for my birthday. <laughs> that, that was my race nutrition. <laughs> oh, whisper's not great on a hot day, put it that way. But apart from that, Ooh, chocolate is a big call on uh, on the summer trails. But a picnic yeah. was awesome. Oh my goodness. <sighs> That is a picnic good... or a lion bar. Those are, oh, star those bars, lion bar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Put them all in. <laughs> I even went for a flake as well. That was a high risk one, but it was a bit cooler in the day. I, I take it. the high risk of a flake <laughs> over, even if that melted, that chocolate's so good. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> oh my God, it was such a treat. Every time I watched Beep, I was like, get in, what's next in the, <laughs> what's next in the back? So yeah, be mindful of the heart rate mindful with the food i may take the poles just to do a bit of in and out the backpack see there's what not it's... much that much climbing though is there but maybe just to just to see if i can get them in and out my backpack and stuff like that just have a little proper i, I don't know how i'm going to do with that but um i'm just really curious after 45 miles um keeping my heart rate at that level what i feel like and i will reiterate it is not a race um what I'm going to ask you about, if you had a coaching client, um, this is my free bit of coaching, this thing, <laughs> with the <an> 800, <laughs> <laughs> we've got heart rate chat, uh, and now we're on the race nutrition. <laughs> well, the 800 is a 24 You'll notice, I always just let you talk, you just tell me what you're doing. Yeah, I, I got yeah. well, it. This, this, is, <laughs> <laughs> this is a genuine question, and I might try it out at, and, at the St. Cuthbert's. To keep it simple, 12 Kendall Mint Cake bars. That's one an hour for, I wouldn't do that, it's quite dull. But do I start with all of that and all I do is in the checkpoints is fill up water or do you maybe take, say, half the calories or a quarter of the calories and use the checkpoints so you're not starting with the, but then it's a bit more random what you're going to be eating, um, sandwiches and whatever they've got at the checkpoints. So I'm really unsure about um, take a chance and start lighter because you could start, you know, literally say, if you have 12 of those um, mint cake bars, that's over a kilo of Kendall mint cake. <laughs> I don't think you want to be eating over a kilo of Kendall mint Well, it'll be a kilo, but, but that's super efficient carbohydrates, mint cake, because it's 100 grams. It's pretty much 100 grams of carbohydrates. So so if you were to go for something like, uh, say, a yeah, Chicho's Black Cat. Do you drink any of your calories? Uh, no, I'm going to be drinking precision hydration, um, just the okay. electrolytes, probably the 1500s. Yeah. Um, so yeah, really. I, if if I'd like, if, yeah, I, yeah, I'd encourage people to drink calories as well because it's just good, mm-hmm. uh, especially on a longer race. You have to carry less, and also as you're just taking in, you're always topping it up, topping those calories up a calorie and a le- if you can stomach it. Really depends on your training and your stomach as well, and what you're used to. Some people. Obviously, their stomach is a lot more temperamental, so they couldn't do that. They'd have to have their own food. Or if you've yeah. got, like, intolerances or stuff, you have to be slightly more. If your stomach's quite steely and you know that actually, and also for a little bit of a mental change as well, you get to checkpoint, what do I feel like? You could be a bit more flexible. Personally, I like the flexible approach to it so you have your nutrition plan whatever that is and everyone's is different um but you've practiced it practice that loads in training so you've got that dialed in what works for you what schedule you're going to do when you're going to eat and drink how much you're going to eat and drink you should have dialed that in in your long runs you've got your St. Cuthbert's way to practice that as well personally um what I like to do is I like to pretty much do my own feeding strategy I use a combination and this is from loads and loads of trial of error of tailwind um spring energy gels cheer charge bars um and that's pretty much it that i'll carry relying on then either being crude or drop bags to rechange the gels obviously much lighter than kendall mint cake as well i can easily carry like 20 30 gels on my being yeah but you know see it's not it's not like the mint cake if you weighed out how many grams per carbohydrate your kendal mint cake is your best it's your your best best yeah. yeah, but I wouldn't like it, so I wouldn't eat it. So I just carry 100 
kilograms. I'm going to go high risk. I think instead of the 1200 calories, I think I might start with um, like 400 calories just to kind of bridge the gap if there's something I don't. I'm going to need all the calories to get me to the first checkpoint, I think, seat weight. And then um, after that, I'll maybe I, And I like to then, like I carry my tailwind powder ready to mix in. So I check when I get into the checkpoint, are my bottles empty? If they're not empty, I make sure when there's like 500 meters to go that I'm downing those bottles that I have yeah. drunk it all. I get, I always keep my powders on one side of my pack and my fuel on the other, you know, on those backpacks. Yeah. On those backpacks, so I get the powder out, take it, I start opening it, and then I hand the bottles to volunteers, <laughs> pull my powders in, and uh, fill those up with me. And then I graze at the checkpoints. I often have Coke, I often have bananas. Mm. Um, I don't really go for maybe a sandwich if i'm feeling oh, a bit like i, I want a, a lot of yeah like jam sandwich especially in the and the, obviously then in the middle of the night it's a bit harder isn't it so it's often i go for like some chocolate or something in the middle of the night mm. for a bit of... i was thinking i'd take a couple of ziploc bags and then one would be a savory bag and one would be a so i'm just really yeah people do that don't they and they fill up the bags and then off you go i mean the checkpoints are there but personally that's what i prefer to stick with like what i know and keep it super simple. i do find it hard to chew um, I don't really like eating when I'm moving. I yeah. do prefer just the gel in, gel in, <coughs> gag, swallow, drink the tailwind. But I do like to drink the calories because then you've always got calories going in if you do have a bit of a lapse with the eating. Yeah, I could do that. I like the active root stuff. So I might do the active root and then maybe do a 500 of the precision hydration because I think there's 500 um, milligrams of the sodium. Um, yeah, a bit of precision hydration. And then you can't go wrong with taking a bit of maybe some emergency salt tablets and a bit of ginger as well. If your tummy does go a little bit, sometimes ginger can bring you back. I'm, I'm really interested too, because the, 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 when my tummy at the Dome Dales, when I, I really, my tummy was pretty rotten on that day, but the effort was a lot higher. Um, so keeping it down to that 130, yeah, if my stomach exactly. can manage everything. It means you can, often these races go downhill for people that go off too fast because the heart rate, just that 10 beats too high, yeah. you can't absorb the fuel, burn through that blood glucose and you're on a pretty much downward spiral from the beginning because you're not fueling. Fuel early, fuel smart. Yeah. That's what I say. It was interesting, Andy, um, didn't he said he got more in early when he was trying, uh, maybe be high, high up with the calories earlier on in the race because later on you just might not be able to fancy them or uh, tolerate you're, them you're anyway basically eating for the back end of the race aren't you you're pacing and you're eating for that back end of the race when you you hit the survival mode <laughs> switch it goes this on 45 mile it's, you... a, it's a pretty good honest test it's not yeah. huge um three weeks out um the, the, the checkpoints and stuff like that trails are not as hard as the lakeland trails but yeah i think it's i'm looking forward to it, actually good okay. perfect time gary we've That's we've it. had an incredible review. Oh, I love a review. <laughs> Look, Gary, honestly, guys, Gary loves a review. He gets so excited. This one wasn't, oh no, it wasn't your standard review. It wasn't written over on Spotify or iTunes. It was on Facebook. And it wasn't only on Facebook. It was an international listener. Yeah. Incredible job. Listen to this. Five stars from Caroline Holloway. I cannot find out where or how to leave a review my podcast up. Fair enough, Caroline. I can't find out where to read them from either. Gary has to copy and paste them. So I'm with you, sister. Uh, that must be the reason you're low on them. Thanks, Caroline. That's kind of you to say that. I have the most, most in capital letters fun listening to Edwina and Gary. I'm a male lady and an ultra runner in the US. I listen to tons of audio books and podcasts, but you're all, y'all, y'all, my absolute favorite. Run to the Hills is the one I can't wait to hear every week. The guests are great, but honestly, I really enjoy hearing the updates about your week of real life, real training, and real mum life. Keep up the good work. Oh my gosh, I love it. I love that there's a male lady in the US of A going around her daily business, listening to these random British people talking about random British stars. <laughs> it's awesome. I just Thank love you. you. Thanks so much. I love it. And I bet you're nicer than the male lady that I have that just pops up on outside my house until I go out. So she doesn't have to get out of her van. <laughs> Never going to a steps competition though with a, a male lady. She would be crushing it. Male la ultra running male lady. Well, this oh my god i bet i reckon that's a 30 40 000 average day step counts <laughs> yeah <laughs> thanks so much for that i've often thought that a male person's job would be a good one to do your training with if you had like a really nice if you were a local um a rural postman i'd just run around with a backpack yeah bring all those letters chats tea yeah oh quick cup of tea mrs Hingle. <laughs> oh great 
<laughs> It'd take me all day to do. I don't think they do that, do they? No. That's on like heartbeat and stuff. Yeah. Not really. I'm thinking of Chris and Pat, aren't they? That was episode 97. Three more episodes, Gary. We're at 100. We can retire in all our glory. Yeah. Made our money. Made our money. That's the what the meeting's about. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Episode 100, we are out of here. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you to your judge for continuing to support the show, sending bars to guest competition winners, and keeping Gary and I filled on all our adventures, hot jogging and all of that, generally being an all-round super support to all these different races and people out running on the trails. Good luck to Gary at St. Cuthbert's Way. Anyone else running this weekend? Good luck to you. Stay hydrated. It's hot out there, folks. I'm Eddie Sutton. And I'm Gary Thwaites. And let's run to the hills. Thank you.